Uh, this is the project uh, Hello, uh, which aims really in the direction of understanding text. Or at least uh, since this is an everlasting topic in AI, uh, my uh, uh, big surprise was that uh, already in 2003 that they were able to achieve a couple of steps which nobody else, at least in my uh, knowledge, uh, did in the past. Um, and in the meantime, well, there were seven, seven, seven eight years uh, happen, and there were uh, new developments and really the talk today would be about these developments uh, on the side of, well, uh, not just text understanding, but also knowledge acquisition, uh, reasoning, and question answering uh, on the, well, textbooks, I think, uh, uh, which is kind of uh, at least structured, pretty <coughs> decently structured part of text which we are using every day. Uh, so, uh, Mark, please. Okay. <coughs> Well, uh, so first, uh, uh, yeah, I want to say thank you to, to Marco and, and Dunya for inviting me here. Uh, I am one of these uh, stranded Americans. Uh, Going to try and be out on Friday, but, and that'll be six days after I was supposed to be out. And so I've been uh, enjoying the, the exceptional hospitality uh, of, uh, of these two and of uh, really enjoying Slovenia. So it's, uh, it's a country I had not spent a lot of time in and it's, uh, it's really exceptionally beautiful. And and one, uh, yeah. Some people spotted the correlation between well, the uh, yeah. problem with the Vulcan, Iceland Vulcan and the name of the company. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Vul Vulcan Incorporated is uh, it's not it named after Mr. Spock and the ears. It's, uh, it's named after the old Roman god of the forge and of volcanoes and of making things. And, and that's, that's kind of what we do at Vulcan. I'll, I'll say a little bit about that. Um, Vulcan is a, uh, uh, what we call the asset management company of uh, a gentleman named uh, Mr. Paul Allen. So, Mr. Allen was Bill Gates' co-founder in Microsoft, um, was a, a executive vice president at Microsoft for, for many, many years, set the direction of the company, um, and, is, uh, 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 and is currently, uh, uh, besides being a, a large investor in Microsoft, is, is independent, and we have this, he has this company called Vulcan to manage his assets. And so those assets range from sports teams, American, we own an American football team, the Seattle Seahawks, an American basketball team, through movie production, through um, uh, traditional investments, uh, through personal services, um, through many, many things that we do. It's, this, it's a small company with a, with a great range. Uh, my particular uh, area in Vulcan is that uh, 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 Mr. Allen has many scientific interests. And uh, many of these are at, at the level of science. Um, they are, are uh, uh, the technologies which are developed are not necessarily at the level at which you'd start forming a company or a startup, but they're at the level of the science. And so uh, it's questions, you know, why is it that I can't ask my computer a question and get an answer? It's a good question, right? Why is it that uh, um, I can't, uh, 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 um, I don't know, why, why is it that, uh, that, that certain kinds of knowledge are so hard to represent? Right. And so one of the jobs that I have at Vulcan is to figure out what kinds of teams would be good to put together worldwide to answer those questions and try and develop technologies uh, to solve them. And Project Halo is, is one such project at Vulcan, where we are essentially attempting to push forward the state of the art in knowledge formulation, reasoning, and, and question answering. So what I'm going to do in this talk is uh, describe at a, at a fairly high level the structure of uh, Project Halo, right? what, what, what it is that we do, and the three um, uh, pieces that we have of it now. Um, I'm going to then take one particular piece which uh, we've been working on recently and which I think is, is quite interesting because it, it doesn't actually require a, you know, a lot of technical depth, but the, the breadth is, is really enormous, um, uh, called uh, uh, semantic wikis. Right? So this is a combination of wikis and databases that we've been working on. 
And I'm going to, at the end, talk to, uh, show you and m maybe demo to you if the, if the network is, is sufficiently fast. Otherwise, I can show you some screenshots of, uh, of something which we built called Ultrapedia, which is a prototype of what uh, we call an analytic encyclopedia. That is an encyclopedia which you can ask data questions about and do data analysis in. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, so first, uh, we'll talk about uh, Project Halo. And, uh, and these three pieces, what I call textbooks you can talk to, right? The analytic encyclopedia and tractable knowledge representation for default reasoning. Um, so so the, the, the big vision here is what we call the digital Aristotle, right? And if you think about it, this has been uh, uh, a, um, uh, a staple of science fiction writing for a very, very long time. Um, there's uh, you know, the, the old movie 2001 where you have uh, uh, the computers which you can talk to and get all the questions answered. But, but really, you, know, you think if you could build this, it would be incredibly useful because of uh, just in science, right? You, know, you can't keep up with the reading. I mean, I'm a scientist, I couldn't keep up with my own reading. And so um, you know, I'm going to get narrower and narrower and narrower, and there's more and more things that I'm missing outside of fields, and I have to go to conferences to, to pick up. And so what is the, the thing that, all, that scientists use? They tend to use Google, right, or Yahoo, or, or some kind of search engine. And that's, of course, great for uh, piles and piles of documents, but it doesn't really answer a question. So here's a, a good question. This is a question which is uh, at the high school level, um, uh, so roughly 10th grade level in the United States. Um, uh, you, you know, after a few months, anybody who's in chemistry should be able to answer this. What is the reaction products if copper is heated strongly with concentrated sulfuric acid? And the answer is uh, um, a copper ion, sulfur dioxide, and water. And so, but, but that's, that's a, a computation. That's not a lookup. But if you found that answer in Google, it would be sort of random, you know, that you could change the question somehow and not find it. So how is it that we can create technologies that you can ask a query to and get the answer to? And that's, uh, that's what we call the, the digital Aristotle. Um, Aristotle, of course, being the, you know, the great teacher, probably the last guy in antiquity, last, maybe the last guy in history, who could have a credible claim at knowing almost everything that there was to know. Right? After that, it just got too big. He was the tutor of Alexander the Great for that reason. Um, so what does that mean? Well, that means that if you're going to get to a digital Aristotle, right? well, you have to have a, a number of different kinds of technologies. Right? It has to be able to answer questions, be proactive, use powerful reasoning. It right? can't be just a lookup engine, and can be customized in its content. So a lot of people have been working on this. This is not a unique vision, right? So what is, uh, so Vulcan's particular take in this is looking at certain kinds of technologies, right? Ones that, that address the problem of scale and what you call brittleness in knowledge bases. So brittleness, if you've, if you've built knowledge bases before, you know that if you build a knowledge base in chemistry and a knowledge base in biology, it is, pardon me, actually cheaper to start from scratch if you want to build a knowledge base on biochemistry than to build one, than to, than to try and combine two that weren't designed to be combined. Um, uh, so we need, so that, but that's the only way you can get to scale. Um, and we also are interested in, in a, uh, not an academic project, but a project with impact, and uh, of course a, a project that is commercializable. And so Project Halo is a one research project uh, to address these goals in the digital Aristotle. Um, in 2004, uh, we, started, we got started on this, on this idea. So we've, we funded a, an effort in six months to figure out, are there any deep reasoning systems out there that are, that are good to build on? Right? And the way we did it is a, a, a way that uh, is actually very standard in American um, research and development practice, which is that you take a bunch of teams and you give them the same problem and you can make them compete against each other for the solution to that problem. So we created, we created three teams to, to try and get some data to figure out whether the state-of-the-art systems can support reasoning in scientific domains and answer questions which were novel, that is, which were not posed to the uh, scientific teams, to the development teams at the beginning, but brand new questions. Uh, the three teams were headed by SRI International, Mendel Park, California, a very well-known company in AI. SciCorp with Austin, Texas, also uh, another extremely well-known and uh, frankly fairly controversial company in AI, and a, a company in Germany called uh, Enterprise um, there in Karlsruhe. 
Uh, and each of these teams had subcontractors below them. And so the, the test was they were given four months, right, to formulate the knowledge in 70 pages of what's called the United States AP syllabus, so in, in chemistry. So that is a, an independent definition of what the content of a first year bachelor's level chemistry course, introduction course, would be. And 70 pages of the syllabus is roughly 10% of that course. Okay, so it's, um, if I remember right, it's uh, stoichiometry, acid-base reactions, and, and some, some other basic chemistry. Um, once they had four months, the, 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 the systems were brought back to Vulcan. We locked them off. We ran them against 100 new uh, AP-style questions, that is, the questions which are at this level, um, and uh, which we had uh, uh, constructed for us by uh, teachers in this area, and had chemistry professors grade the questions. And so the answers were, uh, there were was, there was some, some answers. Um, the best scoring system was scored what they call an AP3, which is uh, AP, the advanced placement uh, uh, courses, are, or the examinations for the courses are graded one to five, so that's uh, right in the middle. So not enough to get college credit, a three is, is, is a low score. Um, but it's not a one or a two either. So we thought that's actually pretty good. Um, that says there's something, especially since there was a, a small amount of, of, uh, of effort put into this. And there, you, there's a, a, a citation for this. So uh, as I say, we thought this was pretty good, right? We, um, I thought the, the, the evaluation was pretty tough that we gave them and they had done better than we expected. Interestingly, it turned out that the most common failure mode was not a failure of reasoning but a failure of the teams to put in good chemistry knowledge, in this case. They were a bunch of computer scientists, and computer scientists have probably forgotten most of their chemistry if they ever knew it. And so uh, there, were there were actually mistakes. They had textbooks in front of them, they were reading the textbooks, trying to put the knowledge into their systems, and they made mistakes, right? It was also extremely expensive. So the, uh, the, each of the teams, for their six-month effort, to do 70 pages of, uh, of, of a syllabus material was given $700,000, right? So maybe 550,000 euro. Depends on what the exchange rate is. Um, so if you do the division, that's about uh, $10,000 per page. Well, that's, that's a lot of money, right, considering the books are this thick. And so, uh, so we then used the results from that pilot evaluation to form a real program, right? And the real program had uh, a, a sort of a, a major goal and three minor goals, right, or three supporting goals. The major goal is can you um, build uh, 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 systems that will allow all of these functions to happen, question formulation, knowledge formulation, et cetera, and put computer scientists out of a job. Right? Because we know that computer scientists now are lousy chemists, they're probably also lousy biologists, lousy civil engineers, and so forth. So can we put them out of a job and essentially put in, to the maximum extent possible, domain experts? Right? And so that breaks into three separate questions. Can, you, um, uh, can these SMEs, subject matter experts, so not computer scientists, but people who are experts in the subject matter, be able to uh, build these systems with adequate coverage? Um, will they be capable of posing questions? If so, we can't have them posing questions in logic or anything like that. Uh, have to be in a, in a language. And, um, and, and do, they, do the systems which they build address all the problems that we found in the pilot? We expanded the scope to chemistry, physics, and biology. We took uh, two teams this time. Uh, one was uh, an SRI-led team. Um, again, this is out of the three, three teams in the pilot. We dropped the lowest scoring team, that was the one headed by Cycorp, and uh, we took the, the, the remaining two teams, um, the one led, headed by SRI, which ran with a system based on concept maps, and uh, one headed by Enterprise, which ran with their system based on F-Logic. And uh, we were gonna do an evaluation and a down select down to one team in, uh, in September about uh, four years ago. So, um, See, this is a little bit out of order. Um, um, so uh, so this, is, uh, this was the answer then. Uh, there's a lot of data up here which I'm not going to go over, but I will pick up uh, a couple of different of important things. 
Here's the pilot system over here with percent correct. Professional knowledge entry, uh, 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 professor, professional knowledge engineers and computer scientists doing the knowledge bases. It turns out there was no natural language in the questions and about $10,000 per syllabus page. Over here we have science graduate students um, actually building the systems for us. Those were our subject matter experts in chemistry, physics, and biology. They used a lot of natural language and we dropped the costs down, to, uh, down by two orders of magnitude. And we got roughly similar performance. Now, I don't, these performance numbers are not great, right? They're in the 30s and 40s, so it's not great. But we were able to show that we were able to, to bring that scale factor down, which was the critical feature for us. We didn't want to make it you know, perfect and a and million dollars a page. We wanted to start with something that was in the cost range that we wanted and then start working on there. Um, so, so these numbers were actually pretty good and, and they were uh, uh, in, in many ways um, uh, comparable to the, to the knowledge engineers. And so based on these results, I'm not going to show you the enterprise results, they were worse, but based on these results, we proceeded forward with Team SRI, dropped Team Enterprise. And now I'm going to go backwards one slide. Um, and this is essentially what SRI did. Uh, it's a, it's a slide which I pulled from another presentation, so there's some review matter on here. Um, but uh, 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 they built a, a system where the domain experts enter their knowledge. The system was called Aura. And uh, it, it creates a knowledge base and imports knowledge uh, from other sources using a, a mapping tool. You create, the domain experts create these graphs. Uh, remember I said that the fundamental knowledge representation system in Aura uh, was uh, this concept map and KM system that was developed at the University of Texas under a lot of funding from our uh, uh, US government research agency called DARPA. Um, and so the domain experts become very good at entering these kinds of graphs and annotating them with, uh, with machine parsable statements. And then we've got a set of users who are minimally trained, maybe have a, a couple of hours of training on the system, they answer novel, they, they pose novel questions in a language which looks like English and they get answers back and more importantly they get explanations which are cognitively interesting as opposed to um, uh, simply proof tree dumps, for example, right, which would be very hard to understand. Um, so this, this is more review of, uh, of what I have just said. So that brings us to today. Um, so today we have uh, a project which proceeds in these goals um, and has, uh, has gotten some amazing results, I think. Um, and it's got three major thrusts, right? So one is this original thrust, which I just talked about, right? Call it on uh, AP level, so high school level, uh, knowledge entry and question answering. And what we want to do there is build it into an electronic textbook. And I'm going to show you some mock-ups of what that might look like. The second thing which we've been talking about is, has to do with a, um, um, a problem in the knowledge entry system which we built, or in the knowledge representation system. Remember that we were using KM and um, uh, the concept maps as the fundamental way of representing knowledge. Turns out that there are some significant limitations in that system. The major limitation is that it doesn't handle defaults very well. That is, uh, if, a, if a fact isn't specified, then you default to a particular value of that. For various reasons, this is difficult in logic to do, and uh, uh, KM does not do it very well at all. The major place where that kind of representation is used is in the representation of process knowledge. Right? So if you think about a cell splitting, the process of mitosis, it's a five or six stage process. Certain things are true at some stages rather than others, and by default they remain true across the processes. So defaults are very, very uh, woven into the structure of processes. We have, uh, as it happens, nobody does defaults very well. And so we saw an opportunity here to take uh, a lot of uh, uh, things which had been developed in the logic program programming community and in some of the theory communities over the past 20 years and uh, talked about by the same 100 people for about 10 years and never got out of that community. We saw an opportunity, and I'm going to tell you about that. The opportunity is called Silk. And finally, I'm going to spend a fair amount of time on Ultrapedia, the semantic wiki work. Um, before I go on, questions? Anything? I know it's pretty hot in here. It's right after lunch. You know, it's tough, but uh, I, I'll take questions in the middle if you'd like. 
Okay, Aura. Um, Aura is uh, the automated uh, user-centered, I always forget what it is, uh, reasoning and acquisition system. This is a picture of what it looks like. That is a chemistry student play, uh, entering knowledge into it. And uh, um, this is kind of what it looks like. If we move forward into actual screenshots, these I know these are going to be very difficult to read, but uh, our, our idea in Aura, one of the things that we do, is general knowledge entry is very hard. If I just took a graduate student chemistry and I asked uh, him or her to sit down and tell me about chemistry, um, I would probably get a mess. Right? I would get things at all different levels and you know, go this way and this way and this way. Our, our, our strategy here is to build on knowledge resources which are already very well structured, that is textbooks. Right? If you think of textbooks, um, there are a lot of them. They are uh, um, they have great things like the key concepts are in bold, right? So you can pull those out. They are written for clarity. The development of the discipline is in a very structured order in, in these systems, uh, and, and typically they build on each other very nicely. So in Aura, the first thing you have is a textbook, and we used the most popular, uh, in this case, biology textbook in the United States, which is used in the in high school classrooms. It's, most, by most popular, I think it maybe has a market penetration of 25 or 30 percent. So it's not a majority by any means, but it's a, it's a, it's a good solid book. Um, and so, and it's or as a two-screen system, and on the one side, the system shows you, shows the knowledge entry person the textbook and allows the knowledge entry person to navigate, write notes, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I have a question. So, why mm -hmm. do you think that the same tool used to teach uh, humans about the um, so we think that, uh, so, so, so two things, right? We're, we're teaching the machines to answer questions, but we're teaching the machines to answer questions in a way that humans will understand, recognize, and be able to fit into a context. So the, the context in this case is students at the high school and first year college level, right? That's where the knowledge is. That's the level of the knowledge in the system. The, um, the reasoning we're asking the, students, the, the computer to do right, is to take those statements at that level and produce another statement at that level. Right? We don't want a, a, a massive uh, uh, graduate quality, postgraduate quality explanation. We want an explanation that is suitable at the textbook level. And so for that reason, we use the text, we use the, the knowledge at the level, which has already been engineered at that level, and simply put it into the system. So that's why we use um, human-oriented systems as our foundation. And also, frankly, because it is much easier, right? If you're looking for the knowledge, right? If you're looking for a concise statement of, of chemistry, physics, or biology in this case, the best place to look is the textbooks. There are no other good resources for that. And so the, the, I think that, it, that actually the, the right way to think about this is if you are doing a knowledge system at this level and you're not using the textbooks, then why are you throwing away an extraordinarily critical knowledge resource? Right? To not only, the, quest, not only the, the knowledge, but questions to test the knowledge, um, examples, graphics, all those things. So that, that would be my answer. How would you relate, let's say, textbooks with encyclopedias, uh, which also would have well structured? Uh, well, encyclopedias are actually not very well structured uh, in this way. Uh, they don't have the development of the subject. Uh, typically, it's not in the right level of detail. The levels of detail are all over the map. Uh, so in, in AI, I think the name of the game in AI is reducing the number of variables, right? It's everything varies all over the place. You know, the level of knowledge, the level of the, of the students, the level of the resources, the you know, mistakes, all this kind of stuff. And so you want to, you know, why solve five miracles when you can only solve two, right? And so uh, by using textbooks, I think it's just completely obvious, right, that, uh, that, that this is, in many ways, a reference statement of what the knowledge is. And that's very hard to come by. You know, if, I, if I was building an AI, I used to work for the Boeing company, you're building an AI system for airplane manufacture, there is no reference statement. You've got to go interview people, and it's just a mess. And so, so starting here is starting where we know, and that's why we do it. Um, that's sort of more in here, the, 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 the um, uh, 
once the a student who understands chemistry, right, so a subject matter expert, reads this, because they understand chemistry, um, they are able to uh, then translate it into these various representational forms, which I have around here, tables, charts, uh, 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 concept graphs, and networks. This, this is actually also a very important point, um, or at least we, we think it's an important point, is that uh, um, AI has not gotten very far, at least symbolic AI of the sort that we're doing here has not gotten very far with just machines, right? What, what seems to be clear to us in the development of successful AI systems is that they function as cognitive amplifiers, right? So essentially there is a task. Humans do some part of that task well. Machines do some part of that task well, right? And in this case, we've split the task so that uh, humans do a fairly good job at reading a textbook. Right? especially if they already know the subject matter. They can read the textbook, they can automatically throw out things that aren't relevant, right? like maybe the history of great biologists, right? which may be not relevant. And they can, they can read natural language and they can translate it into logical form. Right? Now computers can do other great things well. They can reason, they can you know, find logical implications, they can index, they can do all kinds of things like that. And so, uh, uh, so this system is really a hybrid system. It relies on people to do what they do well, machines to do what they do well in order to create a system that can do what nobody can do well right now. Um, so question answering happens, I'm gonna, I think I've got some slides on this. Um, uh, the, uh, so now you have a student, how are they gonna ask questions of the system? Um, we're not gonna have them formulate logical uh, statements, that would be too hard, people are notoriously bad at that. Um, so we, there's all really only one thing to do is to use uh, a language, right? Use a natural language. Uh, natural language parsing technology, uh, in particular for multi-sentence questions, for the kind of par detailed parsing which you need to understand what is exactly being asked. Right? So there's maybe some setup pieces and some, uh, um, a couple of sentences and then some options maybe. That is beyond the state of the art in the parsers that we looked at. And so we, we chose to uh, use a, what's called a controlled language. Uh, there are many of these controlled languages in the world. We used one that is uh, uh, originated at Boeing. So the, 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 the idea here is that uh, uh, the Boeing company manufactures airplanes, sells them around the world. Also, man also airplanes come with manuals that are you know, enormous, right? so you print them all out. Uh, Boeing, for various reasons, only publishes those manuals in English. But if you are Air China, if you are uh, you know, any of the customers of Boeing and you're, you require your maintenance staff to have manuals, those manuals must be translated into the local language. In order to make the, that translation accurate, easy to do, and extremely consistent, both Boeing and Airbus and all the major airframe manufacturers in the world created a simplified dialect of English. The manuals are written in this dialect. This dialect is easy to translate from. So you, have, you don't have push the button, hit the button, press the switch. You have only one way to express this. And it turns out that it's, it's been done, done for many years. It is very easy to train. Right? That's the key. Right? Not only, it's, it's fairly easy to come up with a restricted language. It's hard to make one that is easy for people to learn and natural for them to make expressions in. CPL, which is the, our variant of restricted English in this case, actually is, uh, is quite good that way. And so uh, there's a sort of a, a dialogue cycle. The system will reason with, the with it and answer questions. So we do an evaluation, a major evaluation, roughly every two years. We, uh, so I remember 04, 06, now we're in 08, uh, at least as of this slide. Um, and uh, we do minor evaluations continuously, right? In fact, our systems are always running in the background and have questions being thrown at them. But we do major evaluations with hiring people, having focus groups and whatnot every two years, roughly. And uh, so this was our, what we call the phase two evaluation. So we're getting fairly close in here. Um, we had um, uh, people uh, use a, a, a version of Aura. Again, we had three domains. Um, we had, uh, they were starting to answer uh, uh, up, up, or up around three quarters of the questions in a known set. And then we supplied an unknown set. And the, we were kind of disappointed in this, right? 2008, the numbers didn't go up. In fact, some of the numbers were pretty low. Um, we were happy that 
that, that the domain experts did actually create very high quality knowledge bases. Turns out that a lot of this problem was that the, um, um, uh, there were a couple of things which we were missing in the, in the knowledge. Um, and we had very, uh, uh, a lot of places where we needed uh, uh, system improvement. But still we thought this is, this is still good enough to go on. And in fact, this number um, here in biology was uh, good enough to try for some scale. So remember this, this number is, uh, this is about 50 pages of the syllabus. And so, um, or 50 pages of the textbook. And uh, so, so we thought, you know, maybe what we should do is build on our strength, right? The things that we happen to be good at, the things that our knowledge representation system happens to be good at, how that overlays onto the disciplines. And, uh, and build on that. And actually, at this point now, we've done these little pieces for a long time. And so the question is, can we get to, get to some scale here? And so the, the, uh, the next step was to try and uh, scale up to a, a, what we call a textbook you can talk to, right? A textbook you can actually ask questions of. So we went to India for this, right? We needed native English speakers um, who were, uh, whose labor rates were a, a little bit lower than you could find in the United States. We, in, at Ishkai uh, 2008 in Hyderabad, we actually tested this. We brought an early version of, of Aura. We recruited some uh, students. It was, uh, we did some training and some testing um, just to find out if there's anything that was you know, extraordinarily US specific about what we did or, or America specific or European specific. Turns out there wasn't. <clears throat> and uh, so we are uh, uh, um, uh, attempting to, uh, 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 these were some of the students, um, we were attempting to, we're now attempting to um, collaborate with uh, a company in, 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 in India, right, to find out, number one, are the costs going to be acceptable, right, and number two, is the knowledge entry going to be, going to be of high quality. And the, the major change which we made is this bottom one, that we wanted to be able to move from a single student-oriented knowledge entry system to a collaborative entry system. That was the source of a lot of the errors we defined. <clears throat> then if we can do that, the next thing to do is to actually bake this into a textbook. And what I mean by this is if you've taken calculus, when I took calculus, um, it was in the pre-graphing calculator era. Right? So you spend a half an hour, you get five function points or six or seven, you know, here, 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 and you say the graph of the function goes like that, and it takes you a half an hour. Right? That problem has now gone away in calculus, right? It's the graphing calculator is unbelievably expensive, or sorry, unbelievably expressive, unbelievably fast. The textbooks are now um, written around these calculators and assume that students have them. And the quality of learning, which has been, this has been shown, the quality of learning has gone way up. And so our question is, what is a calculator for biology, right? What is the equivalent kind of cognitive enhancement tool for biology? <clears throat> and our answer is, well, one answer might be, that it is some kind of, let's say, nominally iPad-based system where a student can see the reader, can, can see the textbook and ask these questions of the textbook. Questions be answered with reference to the specific knowledge in the text. That's exactly what a student needs. That's a brand new capability. Nobody has that. You can't ask a novel question to a textbook right now. You need a TA. You need a teacher. Right? And so by doing this, we're starting to put the teacher in the box. And that is huge. So we did another example, uh, we did another uh, 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 test called, we called the knowledge factory test because we wanted to make these as a factory. And um, we, get, we took two, you know, we only know how to do things one way, we compete people. And so um, uh, we took two companies, company A and company B in this case, and we uh, asked them to use three person teams to collaboratively author the knowledge. Um, and then the, all of a sudden, the numbers actually got much, much better. There's something in the collaboration, and uh, I could go into exactly what we, we have some ideas about what happened. We don't have, I think, really firm results about why, why this happened, but uh, um, we found that uh, they were able to replicate the knowledge base creation process. They're, the knowledge formulation engineers right, were able to successfully collaborate. Um, we were expecting scores about 50%, and, the breadth, and a further analysis of the knowledge base showed that these were really good. Now let me tell you a little bit about the people here, because this, is, this actually makes a difference. So the, the company which we, who, who won, we gave the, ended up giving the contract to company A here. 
Um, one of the, they're in a number of businesses, but one of the businesses that they are in is, is patent analysis, right? So you have patents and the, uh, companies will hire, other companies will hire company A to analyze the patents in their field, right? So company A has hired a number of people who know biology well enough to read a patent and are incredibly detail oriented, right? They read it, you have, if you ever do analysis of a patent, you have to read it sentence by sentence. That's exactly what we have right here. And so, uh, uh, so that, that, that also had a lot to do with their success. In fact, their success was greater than biologists who we custom hired in Menlo Park, California to do the same task. They were much better. Right? That was a shock to us, but it was true. So that's what we're going to build. Okay. Um, this is a, uh, uh, forget this part, it's not confidential anymore, but, uh, but this is a um, um, uh, mock-up of a book. If you know what a uh, you know, Kindle looks like, you'll recognize that, right? And so it's a new kind of electronic textbook that would actually contain a knowledge base of that textbook's contents and answer questions, right? So it's going to look a little bit like this. Um, it will have an, a number of different uh, functionalities to it, right? Uh, I'm going to mention two of them, right? To, to of course, read the book, right? The basic, um, and to ask questions. And we also have different ways, uh, which I'm not going to talk about, to uh, support student learning. So reading, of course, you read the material, you know, you, you can see tailored presentations. This is all the standard uh, stuff for, a, uh, for an electronic textbook reader. Right? This is the new part, right? is how do you ask questions? Right? Well, you can type it in, you can do a speech kind of recognition system, right? and you would actually ask a question. In this case, the question is, are genes part of a genome? It's actually an interesting question. If you're not a biologist, the answer is not obvious. And so, and it would just say, in this case, yes, they are. And Chromosomes consist of long strands of DNA. That's actually a generated sentence. That's not a sentence which was found in the textbook and brought back out again. That's a sentence that was generated out of the knowledge base. And, uh, um, and then we've got a definition in here. Gene's got a nucleotide sequences along the length of the molecule and some, some graphics and so forth. That's, a, that's what we're going to be doing. Okay. So that's, uh, that's, I think, where we are on textbooks you can talk to. Uh, maybe at the end I can uh, talk about some follow-up questions. Um, so uh, actually what I will say in, in deference to my hosts is that this is all symbolic at this point. But our architecture is reasonably pluggable. And lots of people have said to us, well, you know, what if you add in natural language uh, understanding technologies, machine reading technologies, uh, different kinds of uh, probabilistic fusion technologies for, si for places where the logic-based system that is underneath is inappropriate. To which I say, absolutely, right? We should do that. We should first get this thing working. So you have something to plug into, but absolutely. Next phase, which I'm going to talk about, is silk. Um, I remember I mentioned default knowledge, and um, unless you're, you know, I don't know if this audience has a lot of logicians in it. If, if not, this is probably a lot of very technical jargon up here. Um, and in fact, I'm, we, we've hired some unbelievable logicians to do this work for us. I think some really some world leading people. Um, and it's, but the idea was to, to be able to represent default knowledge, hypotheticals, actions, events, and process knowledge, right? And to be able to integrate external knowledge bases, which are, which are in a number of uh, incompatible forms. And so Silk is a product for this, and it, it, it's a, essentially a, a set of, uh, of knowledge representation systems based on logic programming and defaults. Um, and a number of modules which go back and forth. One of the things which we're doing with Silk, for example, is trying to take the big psych knowledge base, which is this gigantic knowledge base that was produced in the United States, which nobody has ever really had a good way to independently get to. So it's a very unique knowledge representation system. And, uh, and try and bring out pieces of it which can be used ultimately in the, in the Halo book textbook. Um, so we built a number of uh, reasoning engines and uh, uh, these are some of the features of them. Uh, so you, you start off with sort of simple rules-based expression. This says uh, um, a grand, if uh, x is a grandfather of, uh, sorry, if, if, a, if g is a grandfather of x, that means that uh, y is a parent of x and, and, and g is the father of y. Um, but also higher order, 
right? It turns out that there's a lot of higher order expressions in uh, biology, expressions which range over the value, all, range over all predicates or all propositions. Uh, macros have to be done as a higher order. Um, so there's, there's a lot of different kinds of knowledge which you have to get to uh, if you want to fully represent the knowledge that's in a textbook that is of a higher order nature. There, there are translations of higher order into first order uh, logics. These translations don't work very well. Uh, they're very complicated and they turn into things that nobody can read. Um, I mean, I've mentioned defaults and of course the, the issue with most of this has been is computational complexity. Uh, it's, it's, uh, anytime you, you go uh, to first order or above, you know, the, the first flag that gets raised is that this is uh, uh, NP-complete, that there's uh, all kinds of comp computational problems with this. Um, it turns out that we have a number of new tricks. In the general case, of course, you can never escape the computational um, uh, limits. But we have a number of tricks which, will sh which we believe can show that we will get to the right kind of performance in this kind of knowledge. And uh, again, we can talk about those afterwards. Um, I maybe skip this. If you, this is a feature comparison. We wrote it, and so it's obviously there's, ours is all green and everybody else has a lot of red. But, uh, but, but that does, that's not to say that, uh, that it's not very important. These are rule systems uh, across the top that this competes with, right? So Silk is here, Flora, uh, the RIF basic logic dialect, which is coming out of the W3C, Jenna and Ontobroker and Jess. These are um, open source systems. Ontobroker is, has an open source, or has a free variant. Um, IBM common rules, uh, and so forth and so forth. Um, and then the features down the side. And I think the major thing that, to notice is that we are really the first people to do higher order defaults combined with weak classical. And uh, uh, in this case, to be able to do actions and base defaults. So psych, let's say, doesn't mm -hmm. appear here. Well, that's because psych is not really an, a, a system like, like this is. So psych is a combination of psych L plus uh, order 500 heuristic level modules, which have never been really well semantically characterized. So hard to know. Now, so actually, as you and I were talking offline, um, one, of our, one of the things we have been doing is to analyze psych and figure out what fragments of psych we can semantically, coherently translate into silk, and so bring into our rules engine so you don't have to use the psych engine, right? Um, so you can just use the knowledge without the semantic commitments that are associated with psych. And uh, uh, I, I, what I will say about that is that our results are promising. We've done translations of uh, uh, most of the psych axioms, about 3 million axioms in psych. Our translation's about 98%. But our validation, that's a syntactic level measure, our validated translation's actually much lower in this case, um, maybe about 10,000 axioms. That has more to do with the difficulty of validation than it does. I mean, the, the rest we just don't know about. We're, they could be great, but we, we just don't know about. So that, that's, the, that's the data which I have. Uh, so that's, that's actually all I'm going to say about Silk, uh, because I, what I really want to do is get into crowdsourcing data, which is the thing that makes me very excited these days, okay? Um, so if you think about back to Project Halo, what's the argument for, for, some, for lo something like a wiki to be in here? Well, um, it's a big effort, right? We have these three challenges. Can you build the knowledge bases? Can you query them? Can you get the answers? And if you think about this first challenge, can you build the knowledge bases, right? This has always been very hard. We need something to build very large interlinked bases with millions of assertions in them. I mean, these, these are real numbers. These knowledge bases get very large. Um, and of course, one of the things that you see is that wikis are a great way to crowdsource certain kinds of logically simple information, right? And so um, what we've done is develop this, what we call semantic wiki. Um, let me see, I think I've, yeah. So, so let me illustrate this by looking at Wikipedia. Everybody knows this. So um, uh, if you think, I'm sorry. Oh. So if you think of, uh, of Wikipedia, right? It's a wonderful resource. Um, uh, its accuracy has been studied in a couple of different studies. It is at least as good as, uh, as a, a hand-edited encyclopedia. Um, but its knowledge cannot be exploited, right? The search is limited to keywords, right? Um, and the result, the unit of search is the article. Um, so uh, I've got a number of examples up there that are actually possible to find in Wikipedia, 
but it, would take, it takes about a half an hour to assemble the information. Another example which I tend to use is, suppose you wanted to find out what are the 10 largest cities in the world with female mayors. You know, the answer is in Wikipedia. I, I, I challenge anybody to take less than 15 minutes doing that, and 15 minutes if you're lucky, if you happen to hit the right keywords. Um, another problem is tables in Wikipedia. They are manually built, virtually all of them. Uh, so that means that the instant there is new data, the tables go out of date, unless the uh, um, table constructor, the, the person who entered the new data also found every table in which that uh, data would be relevant. Um, they're often actually inconsistent with the text. Um, the category hierarchy in Wikipedia is uh, quite arbitrary. It's also inconsistent. So the answer to that, we think, is to take the power of a wiki and add a database to it. There, of course, there already is a database underneath Wikipedia. It's a MySQL database. But it's, uh, it's limited pretty much to storing text, text blobs, and indexing text. So what we're really trying to do is add databases with real data in them and the query power of the database and put that back into the social, uh, to the social practices and the software, which has been so successful uh, in, in systems like Wikipedia. So that's maybe what I just said here. I'm going to say, what is a semantic wiki, which is what these systems are called in general. Um, in one slide, it's to apply the wiki concept to data. So wikis are about crowdsourcing text. Right? I write something. Somebody else can write something. Somebody else can change, the, uh, change what anybody. Uh, it's this kind of rolling edit system. And you know, the last edit is the one that is displayed. Um, and somewhere in the practice, we reach a fixed point in these articles, and we get something that uh, what they call the neutral point of view. In, in semantic wikis, we're going to do that with data. That's all I'm saying. Right. So as we say, you know, the population of uh, Seattle is a certain number. Somebody else says it's another number. Somebody else says it's another number. We're also going to crowdsource the schemas in this case. So the word population, the, the property names, and so forth. So the way this ends up working in a wiki and is represented is that each Wiki page right, has a, is a article. Right? The article has a title. And that, 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 that page then, uh, uh, or sorry, the, the concept which is referred to by that title has a set of properties which are around it. And that those properties are explicitly represented as markup in the text. So semantic markup ends up in what we call classic semantic media wiki, ends up just being, just writing right, a statement like that into the wiki article. And that's, that's, that was the early version of that. It means that properties can be introduced whenever, you, whenever needed. You can say things like this in logical form. And then computers can go and pick it up. Right? And so a computer can actually use a wiki to get to facts. There's also, uh, you can import from database and have natural language extraction systems. <clears throat> so we've been working on this, on this uh, system now for about two years. Uh, we think that, uh, that our semantic wiki is um, probably the most commercially mature semantic wiki out there. It may be one of the most used. Uh, there's a, there's a, another free version. Uh, what we did was we built on a, an early uh, and actually still developed uh, semantic, media wiki, semantic wiki from the University of Karlsruhe, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology now, called SMW, Semantic Media Wiki. We built a number of extensions on top of that to make that commercial grade, commercial quality, add visualization, add query power, and so forth. Um, we've been stable since about September. Uh, maybe roughly, this, this number is a little bit out of date. I'll say maybe 20,000 downloads at this point. Um, we've got a, a, a vendor, Enterprise, the company who uh, didn't make it in, their, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, competitions around uh, Aura, uh, um, came back and uh, back from the dead and is, are now uh, uh, one of our con main contractors for this. Uh, that we have users group meetings. We actually have uh, most open source software you put out there and nothing happens to it. We actually have a community of developers. And we've got a number of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, organizations that use this in their, in their world, um, including uh, um, some startups. Um, and what, what you can do in this is the same kind of question that I asked, mentioned before. Uh, you know, show me skyscrapers in China higher than 50 stories built before the year 2000. We can get to that. Um, so now I'm going to show you some pictures. Okay. Uh, so the first thing we, we built a one internally right, to try and play with it. We use this for project management. In fact, this is 
a project management wiki for a piece of semantic media wiki. Right? But what it does is a number of things. Remember I said the table's always out of date? You replace a table with a query against a database, all of a sudden it, and it, and it, and it loads, all of a sudden it's up to date. Right? And it renders actually at the time the page, uh, page is rendered. Um, you can do uh, calendars, timelines, you can try, you know, do all these kind of cool vi visualizations. You can set properties of notifications, right? So people can get notified when things happen. If you've ever done any software technology, right? You know that uh, tracking bugs and, and schedules is actually really hard. Most people end up using systems like Bugzilla to do this. Problem with Bugzilla is that, uh, uh, you know, it comes out of the box with five different kinds of bugs. Blocker, major, minor, critical, I can't remember what they are. And, um, and then everybody sort of uses these categories even though they don't fit because that's what comes out of the box, right? We, the feature requests get thrown in there as bugs. It's all semantically uh, very difficult. These systems actually allow the developers themselves to specify the ontology, that is the classification, of, uh, of the development objects. And so we've had enormous uh, success for this inside our development teams at Vulkan. They just, they love it. They, they tweak it, they change it, and it's always up to date, as opposed to being a real hassle of thing which you try and do. Um, let's see. Uh, another example from Pfizer, right? Pfizer has patent tracking. What they used to do is uh, have you know, some poor overworked secretary create a spreadsheet which had relevant patents on it, uh, which very few people ever looked at. Now what we have is a wiki, but we have all the data of the spreadsheet in it, right? And we can organize things, we can generate tables, we can automatically notify people. We have all the text in the wiki, so the scientists can collaborate, you know, in the same way that you would in a regular text wiki, and ask comments and say, this is valuable, this is not valuable, and so forth. Add new properties, um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, British Telecom, this is something that is being done um, in the, under the active project here in the uh, uh, European Commission funding. It has to do with, uh, again, this, uh, this proposal tracking system. Right? This is a large company, has uh, uh, many, many um, um, bids that are uh, being looked at at, at, uh, at one time across the company, hundreds of thousands of people lots of opportunities in many nations. How do you collaborate? Right? How do you bring together the structured world and the unstructured world? And the answer is, or at least one answer is, well, let's create a wiki and um, let's give it these structured characteristics, these abilities to, to use data, and, uh, and let's allow um, uh, the bid managers themselves right, to create the queries to define the linkages between the other bids. And so the data, which we're looking for, of course, and we don't actually have the, 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 the data right now, but the data which you would like to see is that proposals which were managed through this system have a higher win rate than proposals which were not. If that's true, that's worth a lot of money, and that's an experiment which is going on right now. Um, Snipedia, right, if you're in, so we go to some other things. If you're in biology, uh, uh, a SNP, a single nucleotide <coughs> polymorphism, is a... Um, uh, um, essentially a genetic fragment, right? And there's a lot of study around SNPs now. So one of the things which you might want to do in a wiki is treat these like a database, but still add this kind of collaborative text uh, ability that a wiki has. Semantic Media Wiki, that's exactly what it does. And this says that if you have this particular SNP in your genetic makeup, well, one of the things that, uh, uh, that has been shown about this, or the main report that's shown about this, that uh, in a study of uh, elite Australian um, athletes found that in females, this SNP is associated with uh, great sprinting ability. It's one piece of data, doesn't say anything about what, what you might be doing, but it's an interesting piece of data. And there's just, I, I won't say millions, but there's many, many thousands, tens of thousands of these <coughs> SNPs. And so I, this is an, a knowledge management tool for that. Vocabulary management um, uh, in uh, uh, the United States, we have you know, these healthcare vocabularies that are enormous, um, have all kinds of uh, 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 terminology. If you are in a for something to be a disease, it has to be in a vocabulary because this has to do with the way it's built. These vocabularies are now managed uh, with this kind of technology. Um, and finally, uh, actually, I, I could even go I could even maybe after the after the talk, I, I'll, I'll show some of you this, but I'll, I'll explain a little bit about it. We're trying to come up with, here's a, a different kind of problem. Um, so if you think about video search, right? This 
forget about this middle, middle thing here in the middle. There used to be only two ways to do it. One is tag-based search, right? So you rely on people to put in tags that are, that are uh, come out of some kind of social system. Um, then you do keyword search over the tags, maybe with some kind of folksonomy, but probably not. Uh, very inconsistent tag semantics, as we all know, right? You know, you search on tags, you find all kinds of meanings for tags. Very easy to engineer, though, and highly scalable. That's why these people use it. On the other side, we've got companies like Object Video and Mate, which do real video image analysis. And so they are typically in the security business. Uh, if you have a subway, you know, they can, after a lot of engineering, and figure, you know, write an algorithm that can take a camera, piece of camera data real time and figure out if somebody's left a backpack on the tracks. That's what they can do. Um, very, uh, it's very algorithm-based, uh, a lot of uh, learning technology in there. You can actually do database-style search over it, not just tag-based search. Uh, very consistent semantics, but very expensive and very difficult to engineer. So what's in the middle? The middle we'll call semantic wikis for, vid for video search. So where we actually pull the social database characterizations from the wikis in the way that I just showed you, right, in the way that all these other systems are doing it. Um, we get database search, sort of the power of the algorithmic side. Um, we get semantic consistency maintained via wiki mechanisms. Here it's maintained via algorithmic mechanisms. And so it's not quite as good, but it's often completely good enough. And it's easy to engineer and scalable out of this side. So it's a very attractive combination of properties. And we did a demo on a uh, 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 video from uh, the Seattle Seahawks football team, the American fo football team. So this is a, a, an example. We use a much different look and feel when we built it. And so what we did here is we uh, took some video, right, from football games. And we took, so remember in chemistry we learned that computer scientists are bad chemists, right? Well, we also learned that computer scientists are actually pretty bad uh, football enthusiasts, too. Um, and so we hired a, uh, an intern from the Seattle Seahawks organization who was, who lived and breathed football. Been thinking about this probably since before he was born. And, uh, uh, and we said, all right, tell us what's important about football games. In fact, we'll just give you this wiki and you can start putting in properties, interesting properties of football. And it took him about two days and he did it. And he created this wonderful taxonomy using the semantic media wiki tools of plays, of types, of uh, all, all kinds of things that I had no idea was interesting in a football game. And, um, and then we gave him his absolute dream job, which is, OK, we want you to sit down and watch football games. And at each play, you're going to stop and you're going to put in a little piece of data. So it's going to take you real numbers. It's going to take you about two and a half times as long to watch this game. But, you know, you can sit around, your friends can sit, you, you do it with your friends, something like that. You argue about stuff. And, in fact, it's very enjoyable. Right? And so he did that. We did that for a bunch of games. And all of a sudden now we have semantically indexed video for football that are query-based, right, that are based on the properties that people have argued over forever. And that is really, really neat. So we built this, again, it's demo, this is not a company, but we built this, and it's really remarkably effective. What's the amount of data, let's say, that you, uh, you have for per time of units of this? Well, so, so football, so we chose football for a reason. Um, uh, games are more or less easy to semantically characterize, mm -hmm. right? With it, baseball, American baseball, probably the easiest game in the world to characterize. Actually, can be all reduced to forms, right? And people, statisticians do this. Football is, much, is a little bit more difficult, but still very play-oriented, right? There's uh, plays and people and so forth. Soccer would probably be, European football, would probably be one of the most difficult ones to capture because plays are very fluid and, and so forth. Basketball. But basketball, again, there's sort of, I think we, we, we had a structure, we, we thought that basketball was a little bit more structured than soccer. Soccer is it's a beautiful game because it's so fluid, right? Um, but you asked how much data there is, so on a per play basis here, and if you neglect the video, which is just a blob in this case, and actually managed separately in the database, the data is not large, um, maybe 1K of data, maybe less, if it's compressed. Uh, no, 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 for, for the play, and a uh, football game has roughly 160 to 180 plays in it. Okay, this means that every few seconds there would be some annotation? Yes, that's about right. Yeah. 
I mean, a play, plays don't last very long. Maybe uh, 10 seconds would be a long play. And so that's about right. <laughs> um, but football, if, you've, if you're not familiar with it, it's uh, four quarters, a number of, uh, then there's it's play structured within the quarters, and there's events which turn the ball back and forth and so forth. Um, so this is really pretty neat. Uh, we did other, other stuff. Um, so now let me talk to you about Ultrapedia. So let's go back to the Wikipedia kinds of roots. So all the rest of this stuff is interesting applications. We had a good time. We you know, helped out a lot of companies. We created, I think, really a knowledge management system, one of the first knowledge management systems that nicely combines structured and unstructured data, uh, which is something that a lot of people have been looking for. It's all open source. Right? And so, uh, uh, but now let's go back to our original roots in Project Halo, which is how do we get a bunch of knowledge, right? Let's go back to MediaWiki. So the question is, how can you do what I just did up there? How can you merge Wikipedia articles with the power of a database, right? So what you need then is, this, this comes with two pieces. You need a piece for authors, for the article authors, to be able to mo write more compelling articles. That's what people on Wikipedia want to do, is write compelling articles that people will read that can well show off the things that that author believes are critical about the subject matter. So that means great visualizations, that means being up to date, that means consistent data, um, that means link linking to other data sources that are uh, authoritative or referential. And for readers, that means what you want is something where you can enhance that reader's experience. Right? Uh, so you can provide graphics, you can provide better kind of navigation, you can provide much better query systems. So that's something where the, this is a typical problem, right? is we can build all kinds of databases. It's always the problem in a database is how do you keep it up to date, right? Database that tracks the real world. And so the answer for in, in Ultrapedia is let's leverage the stream of real world Wikipedia updates. That's how you keep it up to date in the same way that Wikipedia is up to date. One of, you know, I'm stuck here for a number of days, right? One of the ways in which I got up to date information about airport, airspace closures is to just look in Wikipedia, right? If it happens, it's there instantly. It's amazing what, what is going on in there. And so what that means is that in the, in the context of the encyclopedia is that where data is actually embedded in the article text and the authors themselves ma maintain it. So that means no da database administrators. It means that the authors are always in the loop. That's how we get our maintainability. And one of the things we had to do then, that means that all of our data provenance goes back to uh, Wikipedia itself. So Ultrapedia actually turned out to be a, a, a a system where we, our goal was to prototype a semantic encyclopedia, right, or an analytic encyclopedia. So use a fragment of Wikipedia with uh, software was Semantic Media Wiki with some of our extensions called SMW Plus. Use actual Wikipedia for checking and corrections and link to other software pieces we did in Halo. So our test domain was uh, German cars. Right? Uh, we took 2,500 Wik Wikipedia pages, about 40,000 uh, pieces of data from those pages. Uh, we hosted uh, at Vulcan um, private versions of Wikipedia, Semantic Media Wiki, of a rules engine called Ontobroker, and something called D a resource called DBpedia, which I will mention uh, presently. Um, and we were able to show the following things. Right? I, I will either show, depending on time, I will either show you this in real time or I will just show you some screenshots. Um, the corrections flowing from Wikipedia to Ultrapedia in real time. That is, somebody updates something in Wikipedia, bang. It's updated in Ultrapedia. Full data source tracking, right? So we understand exactly where everything comes from. Uh, we're able to parse uh, Wikipedia tables. We have feedback. These are some of the, some of the neat social uh, innovations which have happened since Wikipedia started. Bunch of new visualizations, um, external data, derived assertions. So again, what we're doing, if you, this is a Wikipedia page for the city of Bristol. Um, okay, that's a, that, I know you can't read that, that sentence says, uh, Bristol received a royal charter in 1155 and was granted county status in 1373. So if you want that piece of knowledge, you might have to read uh, that, piece of, uh, that, that piece of language. As it happens, it's already, for very important structured data, it's already repeated in these things called info boxes, which appear on the, on the um, right-hand side of the text. And so once you start thinking about that, you think, well, maybe I, I just take that data from the info boxes. And there's a lot of it. Right? If, you, if you look at a page, there's images, there's different versions of the, of the Wikipedia in different languages. I guarantee you that the uh, Slovenian article on Ljubljana is much more detailed than the 
I don't know, Swahili version of that article, if it even exists. And so there's all kinds of cross-correlation you can do. Um, there is uh, uh, plenty of data you can extract. There is uh, descriptions. There's all kinds of stuff. Domain-specific data, coordinates, and so forth that you can use. You can pull all this data together into Wikipedia. Um, you can also, there's been a lot of work in table induction and, and table scraping uh, recently, and so we leveraged a lot of that. So we're able to take, uh, this is a Wikipedia page for the um, uh, Porsche Cayenne, which is a, a model of Porsches. It shows you some of, its, uh, 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 some of its data. And so we're able to take that data, scrape that into the databases as well. Um, now when I say we, I've got to be very careful about who we are, because we in this case is not Vulcan. Right? As it happens, there's a great project uh, that's run out of the Free University of Berlin uh, by Chris Beiser called the DBpedia Project, which is actually in the business of doing all this data extraction. And so rather than do it all again, we just went to them and said, what if we pay you to, 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 uh, to do, th do some custom stuff for us? And so um, they have, a, I think, a, a, a very broad, but, but um, not always as deep as you want, extraction of Wikipedia. So we paid them to enhance their uh, Wikipedia parsing support, do all the table scraping, um, multiple, do multiple info boxes per page, also, their processing uh, in some ways needed some, some work to add all the provenance uh, for all their data. So where did all this data come from, specific line numbers, to make this online. So it's not just a big dump, but it's something which with an API that can be queried off of the live Wikipedia update stream. A lot of work on data structure definition and template mapping. So uh, uh, essentially, you have these info boxes. Now we have to map these into data structures. How do you do that? And so the way that this is done now, uh, post all this work, is through a separate mapping wiki, right? So these mappings are crowdsourced themselves. Plus we have a whole bunch of uh, bug fixes and tweaks. So this is what the flow is then. So start up here with English Wikipedia, right? Now that's, somebody makes a change there, right? That change gets fed in real time uh, to DBpedia, which might do the extraction of any semantically interesting information from that change. Most changes don't have any semantic effect. There's somebody changing a sentence somewhere. But in the things that DBpedia cares about, it can pull out those changes very quickly and then feed that stream into Ultrapedia, which looks just like Wikipedia, except that it has all this wonderful data in it. And so we get two separate streams. One is the text updates, one is the data updates. The data updates go into the database. Text updates go into the Wikipedia text database. And if you make a change in Ultrapedia, if you see a, a problem in Ultrapedia, it uses all the provenance information and invisibly directs you right back to Wikipedia to make that change so that now we've got a million eyeballs that can look at that change. So we've got uh, these Wikipedia-based corrections, which is really the key because that's how we keep our database up to date. That's the problem that most people have had a real hard time solving. Um, so at this point, I could uh, either give you a demo of Wikipedia or show you some screenshots. Probably faster to show some. What, what would you like? Okay. Um, in that case, you're going to have to bear with me while I try and... Uh, no, 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 I don't need the mouse. I just need to uh, see if this works. So I have not actually tried this in a couple of weeks, so, so we'll, we'll, uh, we'll see how well it works. In Sir, mm -hmm. how do you deal with deletes in Wikipedia? Same way that uh, you deal with a delete in a database, we have the logic model of the data underneath and it wipes it out. There's a set of, but that is a good question. There is a set of, uh, of um, uh, oops, oh, what happened there? Um, there's, a, there's a set of, uh, uh, of possible changes which you could make in Wikipedia for which we cannot automatically extract just and only the semantic information and align it with the Ultrapedia article. Um, for example, if I completely changed the structure of the article, reoriented all the info boxes, and uh, I don't know, added, added some tables that were in, in a logical sense unrelated. Um, so we cannot do that algorithmically now. We know pretty much what the limits of the things that we can do are, though. 
And so for those kinds of things, we can kick it out to an editor. Fortunately, those, at least as far as our analysis goes, is very, very uncommon. Virtually all Wikipedia changes are extremely incremental. And it's actually pretty rare that they delete a piece of Infobox data. It's more likely is that they will update it. Um, the reason they don't delete it is because it's almost always the case that the property value, the property is still important. So, um, uh, so let me see. Um, let me. Um, I'm just going to have to quickly set this up. Okay. So this is our private version of Wikipedia, right? Just pulled from the Wikipedia dumps. Now let me see. Uh, well, we can look at the KM. I don't want to do that. So this is, I, I also hope this is up. Okay, so here's the Cayenne. And, uh, and what we have is, uh, this is the standard Wikipedia page on the Porsche Cayenne. If you look through it, uh, it's got a number of these info boxes in it. Um, here's a table of engine and horsepower. And let's say that our, our question is, um, show me all the Porsches. The, the, the question which I'm going to use in this demo is, show me all the Porsches which accelerate quickly. Right? Show me all the Porsches which accelerate in 0 to 60 in 7 seconds, in 6 seconds, 5 seconds, 4 seconds. Um, the Cayenne itself, if you look through, oh, there's a, there's a 0 to 60, there's a table with some 0 to 60 information in it. Um, okay, so now I can pull that. The Porsche 996, was the current version of the 911, um, also has a, a, a similar table. And if I was going to answer this question, it's like the female mayors of large cities question. It's an extremely difficult question to answer. I've got to, you know, essentially create a spreadsheet and start putting stuff together. So that's what's, that's what's going on here. In Ultrapedia, I will show you the, um, um, uh, well, I'll show you a couple of, uh, of things that we do. So first of all, I'll, I'll point out um, uh, we can actually build these navigation systems on the side, right? Well, Wikipedia is a very small thing, right? But Wikipedia does not have this. In fact, most wikis don't because they don't have the structure to be able to do this. This is where pulling data out of the databases. So now we can say things like, you know, let's go directly to all the BMWs. Let's go to, and you, you find there's a little bit of data problem in here. But you find, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, maybe people that you had no, no idea were German manufacturers like Henkel. Right? And they, it looks like they only made one, or Hino Motors. And there's all these German manufacturers, and you can navigate through it that way. So now let me take um, this question about uh, um, uh, which Porsches accelerate fast. Oh, we, we can do pop-ups. We, we do a, a lot of other, other kinds of interesting things. Um, so which Porsches accelerate fast? Here's the Porsche page. Uh, whoops. That's, that's, maybe let's try Porsche. There we are. Um, so here's the Porsche page for the 996. And what you'll see is something that looks like this. So if I, if I actually pulled up the Wikipedia page for the 996, you'd see that table. Okay? That's a table with horsepower, engine, 0 to 60, 10. Well, we've done, this is the version of the table which is a database query. Right. So it's actually the same information in there, power, top speed, and acceleration. But once you have that information, we can also start building a graph. And if we actually get the data, uh, we'll, see, we'll see the graph build, or at least we should. Um, there we go. So this is data on power and top speed. And one of the things that this, this graph makes clear, so this is again just another view of the data in the database, but one of the things which is derived precisely from Wikipedia, one of the things this graph makes clear, by the way, is that the relationship between top speed and power actually doesn't vary a lot between models, right? You have um, um, uh, power that is, that is moving. Top speed doesn't really change because it's governed. 
And what you see is acceleration, though, does change as this top blue line starts going downwards. Right? So why is that if power doesn't, doesn't move? And so an author might use this kind of graph to make the point that power, that is raw horsepower, is not actually the most interesting fact for a sports car. What actually is interesting is torque, because right? that's what gives you your, your acceleration. You can say that in words, but it's really clear from graphs. And so this is how we give authors the ability to use data to make their points. Right? That's actually much more interesting. But you can also, of course, if you have data, you can start doing all kinds of wonderful things, like trying to figure out how much it costs to buy one of these. Um, and so if you, uh, this is actually a live link out to eBay. We can actually get the, act, the, the real um, uh, um, prices for these. And if you wanted to now start building pages and having fun, we can go to uh, pages like, uh, like this one, which uh, again is going to take just a little bit of time. There it goes. Um, uh, or we can look at different Porsches, right? How fast they accelerate. Uh, these are vehicles of four and five seconds. We didn't, play, we didn't do a lot of work with prettifying the tables here, but you can see all this data, which would be extremely difficult to get uh, in another way. Um, we can also, I um, just went backwards, you can also build uh, uh, kind of uh, meaningless um, uh, graphs if you're interested. Uh, so this is, uh, oopsie, it's, uh, uh, where is the table? There it is. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is the graph of length versus width for Audi automobiles. It's not much of a relationship there. So we, this is to make the point that we actually rely on the authors to tell us what an interesting graph is. Right. In this case, length versus width is not a particularly interesting one. Um, uh, let's see. So, uh, so we can do that. We can also look at um, um, uh, pictures. Right? So this is the W212, which is a, a Mercedes-Benz E-Class model. Uh, still waiting. There we go. And we've done, so there's some issues here. We're reaching back into um, some computers at Vulcan. Uh, we've done some timing speed, speed things, and we've, the, the actual load times and the network times in this case are uh, comparable to Wikipedia itself. So there's a, there's a little bit of a other stuff in here. But you can, this is the kind of visualization which we can do uh, out of tables. So it turns out that uh, some crazy magazine, as you can see there, said that this was, this is, you're actually looking at the best looking car in the world, oh, surprisingly enough. Um, and uh, somebody, so we can start looking through, um, you know, these, these runway style visualizations. For some reason that one isn't loading, but you can do all kinds of fun stuff. You can tag these pictures, uh, sort them to look at only, for example, pictures of Mercedes dashboards, uh, uh, that sort of thing. Um, uh, we can build timelines. So let me add that one in. Um, this is... Uh, for Volkswagen vehicles. Um, so we've got a, a little timeline here again. We're parsing out dates. We're trying to be fairly clever about dates. And so we can start to look at where different models occurred. And the interesting thing is, as you sort of go through this, you know, we go back through the 70s and 60s, and there's really not a lot going on in these, the Volkswagen Type 2, the old Beetles and buses. And if we're into the 50s, the only thing which you have here is the Volkswagen Type 2 T1, which is the old original Volkswagen. And then, of course, you see uh, here graphically that not much going on in Volkswagen, no models produced, between about 1945 and 1950. Well, if you think about that, of course, you know why. Right. But here we see it graphically, right? 1945 to 1950, not a lot going on in Germany anyway. A lot of rebuilding. And so... Uh, so we can do that. We can go back to uh, thumbnails and start grouping things. These are all just data visualization, fun stuff for article authors, again, to make their points. Um, and of course, we can do all kinds of mapping. Uh, so let's take, um, um, let's see if I remember this one. I think it's this one. Um, yeah. So cities for Porsche assembly. Um, one of the interesting things here, so there's a, there's a table down here, which you can see. So this, is, this is the actual data, which, which you can get. It's data from Wikipedia. Actually, Wikipedia is, um, is partial in this case. There's some data which is not in Wikipedia. Uh, this data on length and width and height. 
Four Porsches who, who knew it actually are, uh, Porsche has three sites, two in Germany and one in a town I cannot pronounce in Finland, right? So there it is. And we can go and take a look at, uh, that's which, uh, which ones are produced in Finland. So again, we can, it's, uh, you can start exploring the data. Um, you can get uh, um, quite uh, uh, complicated in these explorations. Um, let's look at uh, Mercedes-Benz, which is, un unlike Porsche, a true global manufacturer. Um, it's kind of all over the map, India, um, China. And if you, if you look down, whoopsie, if you look down through the, uh, through the data, you can see that there's actually some data errors in here. Right? Like, for instance, up here, we, we're color coding by city here. So Bremen and Bremen City come up as two. Uh, so, so, that's, so, so the point is that we've got a lot of very interesting and powerful visualizations. Um, now another point is, though, that these visualizations expose data errors. And so this is part of the of the rule about how to keep Wikipedia consistent, or how to, pe how to keep Ultrapedia consistent. So the very last thing I'm gonna show you um, in this demo is, uh, is some stuff on acceleration. Because I don't know if you noticed, I did it very, very quickly, but there is actually a mistake in the, in the Porsche data, or at least there was. Ah, the mistake got fixed, which is why you didn't see it. Um, well, let's take, uh, Let's take one of these. Let's take the Porsche 996, right? 3.8 seconds. Now, let's go edit that data. So, right here, right? So what has happened is invisibly we've shifted now into real Wikipedia, right? And we've gone actually to the info box where that data was pulled. There it is, there's that number 3.8, right? So let's change this to 0.8, right? That's a really fast car. Uh, Let's see, and I'm just gonna say, Mark making a demo point here. Um, and we'll go ahead and save that page. Now I'm gonna cross my fingers because we had an API problem a couple of days ago. See if this works. Uh, hopefully it does. Uh, okay. Now, see, we're, we're back in this, back in this um, uh, on our Ultrapedia page, the data has been changed, so that means we've gone in real time all the way through DBpedia, re-extracted the data, come back out again the other side, redone the query in dynamic time, and pulled it back out again. And if we have, uh, it's not here, but if we have a, um, uh, let's see, I, so I changed it in the Porsche 996, so let's just go over there, and we should be able to see the data changed on that page too. So here's the 996, right? And remember, we, that, this is the page which I was showing you that, uh, that graph, right? The accelerating Porsches. Now, if all goes well, yep, ooh, look at that. That's the fast one right there. Right. And so uh, uh, you can see that, that, that acceleration graph going down. So, so okay, so that, that's, I think, maybe the end of the demo. But, uh, um, but I think, uh, let me go back to the talk here. Um, what I've shown you, right, is something which is uh, similar in look and feel to Wikipedia. We made it as close as possible um, with dynamic tables and charts, really powerful queries. The data is crowdsourced, right? You can navigate in ways that are not, not just search. You can discuss data independently. The data is validated by the Wikipedia community, so that keeps us up to date. So it's really, I think, a better Wikipedia, right? We can interact with data as well as text. Interestingly, most of our time was spent on data cleaning and visualization. The software was pretty, uh, pretty straightforward and stuff that was already in, in Semantic Media Wiki. So uh, some next steps uh, that we're doing here. We need a, a better query system. As it happens, these queries are built with, in a language that looks a little bit like SQL. Um, we need to create something which is more user friendly than that. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of great SQL query reformulators out there from the database community. We just need to do one. Um, we're going to work on uh, genetic data next uh, because Mr. Allen has uh, a, a large uh, philanthropic investment in genetic data from something called the Allen Brain Atlas. Um, I'm going to integrate it with Halo. And now, of course, the question everybody says, well, what would it take to scale up to Wikipedia? All right? 
And well, there's about three million English articles, about a million German articles, there's a long tail of languages. Um, but fortunately, the key scaling factors are actually not the languages or the articles, but they're the mappings, right? And there's not that many of those. We've got mappings for about 25% of them now. Query times in the, in the data store, um, um, and fixing certain kinds of parse errors in Wikipedia, right? This is probably the longest thing that you'd have to do. So if you think big, right, and this is my last slide, I promise, right? The, uh, there's a big concept here, right, which is how could you crowdsource general RDF expressible knowledge, right? How could you get that? Because that's a, that's a big, big deal, right? Um, we've tried in history many ways to build databases that are this big, right, that, are, that, are, that contain this kind of knowledge. And in, in the United States, we've had, uh, Sycor has tried, DARPA spent a lot of money on HP, uh, DARPA, are one of our major uh, research uh, support companies, or research support organizations from the US government, has had rapid knowledge formation, machine reading, lots of, lots of ways to do this. None of them have been completely successful. Um, and we, one, but one of the things that we've we figured out is that we need a lot of eyeballs, right, to curate and maintain this data. You can create big databases, they always go out of date. So the idea is let's leverage the human reference of choice and the human social creation system that seems to work. Wikipedia is, I'm just gonna read this, right? Wikipedia is already the central encyclopedia of the world. That's what it is, right? So let's use it to build the central database for the world. Wouldn't that be cool? And so the question is, how do you scale it all the way to Ultrapedia? And uh, um, this is not a job I think that Vulcan would do alone, but, uh, but it's one that I'm talking to a lot of people about, about who would want to be in it. I think it would be fantastic. I think it would be a game changer, right? To be able, one of the problems with artificial intelligence is we've never had enough knowledge, right? Now we can get the knowledge, we can get it up to date, we can get it quickly, and we can get it from the very source that humans get it, right? Which is, I think, would be tremendous. And so uh, I think that's actually what I will leave you with. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm. So, uh, any quick mm -hmm. questions? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to use Wikipedia to, to query um, eBay in a better way? Um, to query eBay in a better way, that's an interesting. I, I don't know the answer to that. I think what it would do is it allows the, these queries to exist in context right now. Uh, there actually are a fair number of eBay querying apps out there. You know, I've got my, my phone, right, and I can put an app so on it. For instance, if you but, put in a query like, give me all the Porsches on eBay which are faster than which has accelerate faster than six seconds to, from zero to 60. Um, currently, the, la the query language is not expressive enough to reference that, but that's a good idea. We, I don't know that we can do that, uh, but, but, but would be interesting. Um, we can reference it by model number, right, which is the way that uh, the eBay query system lets us happen. But, but you actually, you touch a sort of a, another interesting point, which is the world is full of data sources, right? And so it makes sense for reference knowledge bases to have not just duplicated data, but go back to the source. I don't want to see the data from, um, uh, uh, I don't know, Wikipedia on the names of particular types of cancers. I would like to go to a government authority which tracks this, you know, the National Health Service or National Institutes for Health in the US. And these, these data sources, these are always made available as data, almost uniformly. And so you could, so it, it allows you to really, I think, create this analytic encyclopedia, which actually has community vetted data sources as part of its articles, woven into its articles, and woven into the analytics which it supports. And I think that's pretty neat. Any other comments, questions? Yeah. Uh, Tough lunch time. Yeah, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was a little longer, yeah. but I guess it was uh, yeah. quite interesting and yeah. quite relevant. Uh, I mean, I have plenty of questions, but we'll discuss afterwards, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have. Do you have any um, facilities for, let's say, checking correctness, consistencies, uh, let's say, which would use some, let's say, rules specified to see which kind of properties would be functional properties and which functional, so there wouldn't be any conflict? In yes, we do. We, so I didn't, uh, so it's a good question. I didn't go over that part of it. Um, Semantic Media Wiki itself has uh, a number of different ways to, if not check knowledge base consistency, at least do data integrity checks and add flags. 
So uh, we don't do inference-based consistency. You know, if I say uh, a person can only have one father, and uh, you know, an owl, and I say uh, uh, Joe is my father and Fred is my father, then the system will automatically conclude that Joe and Fred are the same person, right? That's usually not what you want to do. <laughs> usually, you want to flag that as a mistake, right? And so, what we built are a set of uh, is a facility in Semantic Media Wiki of check what we call checkbots. These are pieces of arbitrary Java code which sweep over the database and will tell us things that might be mistakes as well as things which are consistency violations. So that something that might be a mistake would be, uh, I don't know, a class with uh, 10,000 members, right? It's, prob you know, it's possible that's right. It's not logically impossible, but it's probably a mistake, right? <laughs> Or, you know, classes with no members, there's all kinds of issues like that. As well as uh, numeric violations, you know, date ranges which uh, are, you know, down to the actual day and a million years ago, right? Things like this. So we have a variety of those. We also have um, a small rule system which works in this, uh, in Semantic Media Wiki. And it runs off of either open source Jenna or if you want to go commercial scale onto broker, um, which uh, can do things like unit conversions and also some basic owl, owl type, uh, owl light type semantics. Um, so, so I think the answer then is there's a lot of software support in this. There's a lot of built-ins for this. What is really interesting is what kinds of integrity checks are appropriate for your data, right? Because sometimes full owl is actually, frankly, often too strong. And so, uh, uh, so we have the facilities to do this, I suppose, an open R&D question about what the optimal set would be. Okay, okay uh, mm -hmm. so thanks again. Thank uh, you. Uh, <laughs>